Hello everybody, Chris here, and in this video I want to give all of you my guide to GIMP for Mac OS. So if you don't already know, GIMP stands for the GNU Image Manipulation Program. So it's essentially like a free version of Photoshop. It doesn't have quite as many features, but it is still a solid program if you are trying to edit photos, images, or just graphic design in general. So when you've opened up the program and you want to start a new document, you should go to the file menu at the top left of your screen and then go to new. You'll be given this window where you can choose the image size. So this by default is measured in pixels, width and height. Every single pixel can have one color. And then when you fill in all of the pixels, that's when you come up with your image. But if you prefer, you can measure your document size and other options such as inches or centimeters. So that can be helpful if in the end you plan to print out your graphic to some kind of real world surface. If you're interested in your print resolution or pixels per inch, for instance, you can expand the advanced options and you'll be able to see your X resolution and Y resolution here. So if you're going to be printing a document to a piece of paper, for instance, that has a certain number of inches wide and high, and you want to know how many pixels it's going to try to put on each square inch, then you can use these metrics to figure it out. Or of course, if you're working with other systems, you could use pixels per centimeter and that would be similar. So that's how you can adjust your print resolution. But your display resolution on the computer is going to be up here in image size. So for most of the web stuff I would be doing, I would just keep the measurements in pixels. So I'm just going to use 1920 by 1080 and we will open up a new document. So by default, generally, when you open up a new document, it's going to fill the background in with your background color. So you can see over here in the toolbox area, there are two colors here. The one that shows in front of the other is the foreground color and the other one is the background color. So if we were to go back up to file new and then take a look at the advanced options, you'll see fill with background color as the default. Since the background color is sitting right here and the background color is black, that's why I have a black background. If your colors are still the defaults, then it would probably be a white background by default. So to talk more about this area, as I mentioned, it's the toolbox. So most of the tools that you're going to be using to interact with your document, whether you're working on a new one from scratch or if you're loading in a photograph or image, from somewhere else on your computer. The tools that you're going to use for that are going to be up here. So if you've ever used GIMP before, but it's been a while, you may notice that the number of options here have actually been condensed down to drop down categories. So anywhere that there is a little triangle at the bottom right hand corner of an icon, you can right click and you can see the other related tools uh, inside of a drop down menu. So with the move tool, if you right click, you can also see the alignment tool is hidden inside of there. If you right click on the paintbrush, you can see pencil, airbrush and other tools are available there. The hotkeys are always going to be listed over here to the right. So you can see that the key to switch to paintbrush at any time is P N for pencil. And then many of the other useful tools would be listed over here where you have the scale tool by default. But you can also see rotate perspective and flip tools here as well. So let me try to go over five or 10 of the most commonly used tools in the toolbox. So rectangular select here, you can right click and switch it to ellipse select if you want it to be an oval shape instead, but rectangular select, I think I would use that more often. So when you have rectangular select as a tool, note that on the cursor, it'll show what tool you have selected. So you can see the little dotted line box next to my cursor on the screen. If you left click and hold and drag a box while still holding down the left mouse button, then this is going to give you a selection on the screen. So when you let go, you'll have this dotted line going around the area. You can adjust the corners by pulling on wherever you see a box, left clicking and holding to adjust each of the sides. And if you want to do one side at a time, just go for the middle section. So once you have a selection on your screen that you want to interact with, only the areas inside of your selection will be affected by any edits. So for instance, if I click over here to switch over to the paintbrush tool or click P on the keyboard, and let's use the tool options here for size to increase the size of my paintbrush to a reasonable amount. So you can see kind of the outline of roughly where it's going to be drawing on if you hover over the screen. Let's go ahead and start drawing inside the bounds of this rectangular select. So if you left click, you hold, draw, and you drag some lines, then you'll see the only areas that are affected are those inside of the selection. So this is important to know because sometimes you only want to edit a specific area of your document at once. So this is jumping ahead a little bit, but let me show you what I mean. Let's jump up to the colors menu and then I'll go down to this brightness contrast adjuster. 
And then let's raise the brightness. So this will make everything inside the selected area brighter. So because I have that selection already made, when I increase the brightness, it's only going to actually increase it inside of this box. So I'll go ahead and hit OK on that. And if I wanted to once again adjust what I'm affecting, I can hit R to go to rectangular select mode. And let's drag another box only around this side of the area. OK, and I'm going to go up to colors and let's do hue chroma this time. So I'm going to shift the hue of this color away from red to whatever else I can come up with. So you can see you could just take one color and make it any other color you want and then hit OK. But no, only inside of this box was it affected. The original box we messed around with is still red. So selection is a really powerful mechanic inside of Kemp. We already showed off the paintbrush tool. Let's click on the menu, right click more specifically, and let's switch to pencil. So the thing you need to know about pencil is that when you draw with it, it's going to be a hard edge. So I'm going to just click here and drag down. And the more I zoom in, the more you can see that this goes pixel by pixel drawing down. So it's going to look very, very rough compared to when you draw with a paintbrush. It has kind of a blurred edge. It's a fade from the center area where you're having a full color to the edge where it just is the background color. So everything in between there gradually goes from the original color to the new color that you're drawing with the paintbrush. But with the pencil tool, it's a hard edge. Now, if you want your paintbrush to look more or less smooth, let's switch back to the paintbrush tool. Then you would want to click on this brush selector. You can see that there's other brushes you can play around with as well, but the main ones are going to be this 25% hardness, 50%, 75%, and 1.0 or 100% hardness. So the higher the hardness is on the edge, the less of this blurriness there's going to be. So if I have a hardness of 1.0 and I draw a line, there's going to be very, very little. But no, it's still not the same as the pencil tool. You still have maybe a single pixel or so where it actually still needs to transition to the main color. So there's just less, but not absolutely zero. And then, of course, if we use 25% hardness and we draw a line, it's very blurry all the way across, only in the very center. Is it just a solid show of that main color that we have? And if it wasn't obvious, when you're drawing with paintbrush or the pencil tool, you're drawing with the active foreground color. So if you want to change your color, you can click here. You'll get this little color selection window and you can switch to a different color. And there's many different ways you can adjust your color settings and how dark it is. If you just want it to be dark, just pull this and bring it towards the bottom. If you want it to be more black and white and less colorful, pull it towards the left side. And if you want it to be super vivid and bright, move it to the top right corner. Then everything else is kind of in between. So here we have a new color selected, but otherwise still using the same 25% hardness. So for any of the tools, when you select them, these are your tool options down here. Different tools are going to have different options, and there's quite a few, uh, way too much to explain in a single video. But one thing to note, if you're ever missing the tool options over here, then you can go up to the Windows tab. Toolbox can open up this toolbox, but if you go to Dockable Dialogues, then you can also find tool options. So this will bring up the window for your tool options. It'll bring up a new copy of it if you've closed the original one. And each of these areas, like the toolbox, the tool options, and your layers window are dockable dialogues. You can also see you can have multiple windows in a single area in a tab form. So here you have the layers window, the channels window, paths window. And up here in the top right, you have documents history, brushes, patterns, and fonts as well. So let's continue talking about some of the other common tools. Text tool, whenever you want to add text onto your document, like a title, is very helpful. It's going to default to your active foreground color. So if we take the foreground color and we make it white, then you'll see the color updates down here. You can select your font with this menu, which is probably the easier way to do it. Or if you know the exact name of your font, you can type it into this box here. The size is going to be one of your main settings. You can see by default, this is in pixels. So if you're working on a bigger document, you're going to need a bigger size, of course. So let's click and let's start typing text. And you'll see that there's four corners. These are adjustable, just like with the rectangular selection, but there's nothing really to adjust yet. So let's type in something. So I will say GIMP for Mac. Okay, now let's zoom out a little bit. So when we type into this window, 
the corners and the sides where we can adjust the size of this layer are going to reposition themselves and we can manually adjust it as well but it will at least stretch to the size of our text if you want to edit the text when it's already been typed make sure you left click and select the characters you actually want to adjust you can see that every single text character has its own yellow box if it's not selected then when you change settings up here it's actually not going to affect it but also at the same time you can adjust settings on a character by character basis so if i wanted to i could just take this text right here select those four characters go up here to the size and type in 500 pixels and hit enter now you can see that these characters are bigger than the ones over here and like i mentioned you can do one character at a time so i could go here type in 600 okay so it made it bigger but if we wanted to be on one line we kind of got to expand the box so just keep that in mind and you can change the color of course so i can take this middle area and let's take the color and make it something like a light blue since the text is actually kind of big too big for the document i'm going to do command a on the keyboard to select all the text you can see because there's different values for the size here that it doesn't show a number here. So let's type in how big we want the text to be. So I will type in 415 and hit enter. So now all the text is resized back down to 415. Let's switch to the move tool now, M on the keyboard if you want, and you can move this text around the screen. So I'm gonna move it to the bottom here. So it's actually kind of more visible. And the reason we're able to move the text without moving the background is because these actually exist on separate layers now. So if you look in the bottom right hand corner, you'll see the background layer is everything we drew on before, including the black background. But then right above that is the GIMP for Mac text. So when you use the text tool, you create a text layer. And by clicking on a layer with the move tool, you're able to move it around the screen. One of the other things to note about the move tool is if you look at tool toggle here, you'll see that by default, pick a layer or guide is the default. So that means that when you left click, you're going to be moving the layer that's under the cursor. But if you hold shift down, then you're going to be moving the active layer. So if I hold shift, you can see it switches to move the active layer. And when I let go, it moves back. So if I'm not holding shift and I click right around here, then it's actually going to select the background layer to move. And because everything's on the same layer, it's all going to move together. But if I hold shift down, it doesn't matter where I press on the screen it's going to be moving the actively selected layer. So you can see I'm not even clicking inside of the yellow dotted line box to move it. So that's kind of important because sometimes you have a lot of layers selected on top of each other, and then you'd want to select the layer you actually want to edit from this layer window, hold shift down when you're using the move tool, and then you'll be guaranteed to move the correct layer. We'll talk more about layers in a little bit. So for now, let's jump over to the paint bucket fill tool. So the paint bucket fill tool is going to, by default, fill similar colors with your foreground color. So if you want to make everything one color, then you can click on your foreground color, change it to the color you want to fill, and then find the area that has that color you want to switch, and then left click, and it's going to move everything over to that new color. You can also fill with patterns. So if you click pattern fill, default for pine, so that could be a quick background. You can click here and select other patterns installed on GIMP. And of course, if you go on the internet and look around for pattern downloads, you can find more that you can load into GIMP as well. So in the same menu as bucket fill is the gradient tool, G on the keyboard as a hotkey. So the gradient tool allows you to fade between colors. So if we click on this drop down, you can see the different default gradients. So most of these down here, I wouldn't really use that often unless you're looking for a specific look but uh, more commonly would be fading from one color to another color. So if I choose, let's say foreground to background, FG to BG, then this allows you to go between the two colors you have selected between your foreground color and your background color. So if I click here on the background color, well, let's change it to a light blue, then you'll see this gradient icon updates for red transitioning into blue. So when you left click, Anywhere on your screen, you'll start the gradient start point. You hold it down and you move it in the direction that you want the gradient to go. So I'm going from bottom to top. So we have the start of the foreground color going upwards towards the top where we have the background color of the light blue. And that's how we basically set our gradient direction. You're going from the start point to the end point with the colors that are set in the gradient. And it is possible to have more than two colors in a gradient. But I think nine out of 10 times, you're just gonna do it with two colors. 
so if you don't want it to just be a simple one color to another color, you can change the shape. So another common option might be bilinear. So where we start the gradient is going to be the foreground color, and then it will spread out both in the direction I pull and away from the direction I pull. And everywhere else is going to be that background color. So the further I pull, the bigger the foreground color is going to be. But you can see that it's using the background color on two sides here. So another option radial, the center point is going to be your foreground color spreading out until it transitions into the background color. So you might wonder, aside from just filling in the background, what can you use gradients for? So a good example, and I'll put this in linear mode uh, for this, is to fill in the shape of your text. So if I right click on the text layer, I'll do alpha to selection. Now remember, whenever you have a selection in GIMP and you use a tool, it's only going to be filling in or affecting that selection area. So if I left click now down here and I pull and then I pull up on this, then it's going to be filling in the gradient, but only for the size and shape and position of the text. So I let go here and now we've taken our text and we have filled it in with a gradient. However, I want to point out that when we did that, we actually changed this GIMP for Mac layer away from a text layer to something else. So now it's just part of a normal image layer. So I'm going to hit Command Z and undo that. If you want to be as non-destructive as possible, what you would want to do is create a new layer in the bottom right hand corner. So this create a new layer button. You can call it whatever you want. I might call it text gradient and then hit OK. So now we still have the same selection from before. If you need the selection again, right click on your text layer and then do alpha to selection. But when we actually draw the gradient, make sure you're on the text gradient layer and then start your gradient just like before, let go. And now the color information is actually on the text gradient layer. So if we hide the text gradient layer, you can still see our GIMP for Mac text is there intact. And that's important because if we wanted to change the text in any way, uh, we could switch back to the text tool and we can still click in there and make edits such as changing the size, color, or the font of the characters inside of that text window. But this gradient is just a image. So you can move it around the screen, but you can't edit it as text. So it's actually a totally separate thing. But once you've exported your document, it's effectively the same. It's just an image on the screen. Okay, let's talk about the scale tool and some of the other options you have here. So scale, if you want to make a layer or a selection bigger or smaller, you can click on the layer that you want to affect, left click on the screen or the area, and then drag it out in the direction that you want it to go. And then you take the box for the layer sizing and you just stretch it until you have it in the right size. And you can see the preview of what it's going to be when you hit scale. One setting you want to keep an eye on is around center here. So if you turn that off, it's no longer going to be scaling from the center of where it was before, but the corner directions are actually going to matter here. So if you pull in one direction, it's also going to be scaling up in that direction. And if you want to go back, just hit Command Z and you can keep resetting it back to the default until you get it right. You can also scale things down too, of course. And if you'd rather set a specific number for your scaling, then you can just go up here to the scale tool and type in the number. By default, it's going to scale the width and the height together. If you don't want it to scale the width and height together to keep that aspect ratio, then just unlink the width and the height by clicking there once. Okay, so let's get out of that tool. Another tool you might use, rotate tool. So if you click on your layer that you're editing, and then you left click and hold, you can drag this around that center point and you can rotate your text or anything else around on the screen. Now, uh, keep in mind, the rotation is going to be around this center area. So if you want to change that, you can click on it and you can move it to a different area. And now when you rotate, it's gonna be changing what it rotates around. So that can be important. Now for this text to gradient layer, you can see the layer size is much bigger than the text itself. So if I wanted to actually make the selection just where it has color information, I can right click on my text gradient layer and do alpha to selection. And now when I use the rotate tool, it's going to default the center point to that center area. So if I click rotate, it's going to commit the rotate 
Same with hitting scale, it's going to finish the change. And anytime you want to undo, just do Command Z. And now that I think about it, a good window to know about is the history window. So if you go up to Windows, Dockable Dialogs, and then let's go down to Undo History. You can use this window to go back to a particular point in your editing of your GIMP document. So if you click, it'll just go to that point. I don't know exactly how many this can remember, but quite a few. So if you make a series of mistakes and you want to revert, then you can use the undo history in order to go back there. And actually by default, it is over here next to the tool options window. So undo history is right here shown as an icon by default. Uh, just remember that tool options is right there as well. So click there if you need to change any settings about your tools. Uh, so let's see another one flip. If you want to make something go left to right, just take the flip tool and click once. And now it's going to flip horizontally left to right by default. If you want it to hold vertically, then you can just click here to switch to vertical mode, click once, and now you're going to flip it vertically on the image. Okay, so the eraser tool, pretty self-explanatory. You can erase the color on your image. Uh, by default, it's either going to go to background or transparency, depending on whether a layer has a transparency layer added. So right now, the background layer does not. So if I left click with the eraser tool, kind of like the paintbrush tool, it actually paints with the background color. So I'm going to command Z undo that. If I want to make sure that when I use the eraser tool, it's going to be transparency instead, then you right click on the layer you want to be able to have transparency and you choose add alpha channel. So now when I use the eraser tool and I just draw, it's going to be erasing all of the color information in those pixels. You'll know it's working because you'll get this checker pattern behind it. And if you were to export to a PNG image and show a PNG image on the web, then it would be transparent still. It would show anything that's layered behind it on a web page because the transparency information just allows anything behind it to show on top of things. So on the web and other places on your computer, things will be built with layers. Uh, just like in your GIMP document, you can have layers as well. So for instance, if I actually create a new layer in the bottom right, and let's hit OK here, Let's pull this layer beneath the background layer, but then I start drawing on it. I'll use P for paintbrush and let's just make some strokes. So you can see right now I'm drawing with the paintbrush tool, but nothing's showing up. But as soon as I go into that area that is transparent, it's going to show. So if I hide the background layer by clicking on the eyeball and the layers window, you can see the area where I actually drew with the paintbrush. But if I show the background again, then only the areas which were transparent on that layer are going to be able to show any extra color information beneath it on a lower layer. So transparency allows background layers to show through in essence. So I've been talking a lot about layers inside of GIMP. So a document can be composed of many layers. Whenever you're talking about a canvas, you're just referring to the entire document as a whole, everything inside of the bounds that you can see. The gray area is outside of your canvas and anything inside of this bounds is your canvas area. So if we go up to image, you'll see options like canvas size and fit canvas to layers. So your canvas size is the area which is drawable upon and your layers are going to be what composes your canvas. So one canvas or one document can have many different layers. So when it says something like fit canvas to layers, that means it's going to be stretching your working size to the size and position of all of your other layers. So let's use the move tool and I'm going to click on the background layer. Let's move this background outside of the canvas, which is definitely possible. You can see when I let go, the yellow dashed line goes outside of our canvas bounds. If I click on each of the layers, you'll see that they have different sizes and positions on our screen. So if I go up to image and then I choose fit canvas to layers, it's going to stretch the canvas to fit all of the layers and their sizes and positions. So when you look at this and you click through the dashed lines, hopefully you can kind of get a sense of the difference between the layers you're working on and the canvas itself. So let's command Z a couple times in order to undo that, get back to where we were. Or you could use the undo history if you want. You could just click up here and get back to the previous step. So on the flip side, there might be times when you want to take a layer and resize its bounds to match your canvas. So with the text layer here, it may not make sense to allow it to be outside of the canvas. So I might go up to layer 
and then layer to image size. So now you can see the dashed line matches our canvas. Note that's another operation that takes your text layer and turns it into a standard image layer instead as well. So I'm going to control Z that for text specifically. You might want to hit T to switch the tool mode and then resize the position of your text like this instead of doing those operations on the layer itself. So I'm going to command Z a couple times as well. Uh, just keep the text under the text gradient. Uh, so now would be a good time to save our document. So I'm going to go up to File, Save As. So you can use this window to find a location on your computer where you may want to save images to. When you navigate to a folder that you really like, you can hit this plus button to make it a favorite. Like I have this thumbnails folder where I have basically all my YouTube thumbnails stored. So here I could just save it as a new document. So let's say GIMP for Mac. And this is going to save by default as a .xcf file. So this is the standard format for a GIMP document. And let's hit save. So the reason you would want to save it in a GIMP document format rather than immediately saving it as a JPEG or a PNG is that once you export to a JPEG or PNG, those files are no longer editable as a series of layers that are separate from each other but it's just going to be composed of a single image file. So if you ever loaded it back into a program like Kemper Photoshop, when it's only being represented as a PNG image, then it would be as if everything was composed of one layer like this, where if you use the move tool, you have to move everything. And if you wanted to use a paintbrush tool on it, you'd be drawing over everything. But the advantage of having those layers available is I could do something like click on the text gradient layer draw a red line over here. And if I ever decided I didn't want that red line, what's well, part of the text gradient layer. So I could just hide or delete that layer and it wouldn't affect the background layer at all. So having things in layers is really helpful because it allows you to make changes separate from each other. And then you can delete all the changes in a single layer or hide it all at once rather than affecting your other layers at the same time. So the more layers you work with, Basically, the easier life is going to be if you ever need to undo or make changes again, uh, because all of your changes are separate from each other. So let's talk about some other cool tools. Guides in GIMP are very, very handy if you need to have things positioned at exactly the right moment, at exactly the right point. So if you go up to image, you can come down to guides and do new guide by percent or new guide by pixel if you want as well. So if you do new guide by percent. You'll get a pop-up window. By default, it'll be 50%. So 50% horizontal means that it's going to come down here and put a line halfway through your document. So let's hit OK. And you can see this blue dashed guideline. So you can click on the guide and move it if you want its position to change. Or you can hit Command Z a couple times to undo that. Let's go up to image and do new guides by percent again. And you can change the direction to vertical and hit OK. So now it's a vertical line going top to bottom. And by combining those two, we have a center point. So if I wanted to take the text layer and move it right into the center, I'm going to use the move tool. Let's show tool options. Like I mentioned before, I'm going to hold shift down to move the active layer. I'm going to click and now I'm going to move this text out into the center. So this is dependent on the center point of your layer. If I let go, you can see that the bounds of the layer don't exactly match the position of the text, but the layer is centered. So I could hit Command Z, and if I wanted to make sure it was the text that got repositioned correctly, I can right click on the text layer and do alpha to selection. So if I was in a situation like this and I wanted to make sure my text was going to be centered, I would hit T to go to the text mode, click in there for the text, and let's uh, resize the bounds of this text layer to be more appropriate. And now let's click on the move tool and we can reposition it and it'll be a lot closer to the center. If of course, when you're using the text tool and you just type things out, it'll be centered by default because it's gonna match the bounds to fit the text correctly by default. But so by default, snapping to guides is enabled, which is what makes guides so helpful because you can make sure that something is gonna be exactly where you want it on the screen when you snap to it. If you wanna see other snapping options, you can go to view, and then there's options like snap to grid. So let's show the grid and then let's do snap to grid. And I'm also going to turn off snap to guides for a second. So now it's no longer going to snap to the center of that guide. But when we have the grid selected, you can see that the grid kind of works like its own guide there. 
Now maybe this made way too many points for this to snap to. So we can change the size of our grid by going to image and then configure grid. And maybe we make the pixels 64 by 64 and hit OK. So when we do that, now you can see the grid is a lot more spaced out, but we can still snap to it. So you can see we can snap it to the center where they meet, or you can just move it along the line, either horizontally or vertically. So that can have some use too. Let's turn off the grid for right now and let's turn off snapping to grid. Note that you don't actually need the grid to be showing for the snapping to work, but I would usually have it on if I was gonna do that. You can also do, uh, let's see, snap to canvas edges. So if I want, you can see that our snapping can go all the way around the edge of our canvas. Okay, I forgot to turn snap to grid off. So, okay, now we can see snapping to the edge of our canvas. Now, the next one, snap to active path, that is an interesting one. Let's switch to it, and let's actually hide everything else on our document. We don't really need that for right now. So you might wonder, what is it talking about with paths? So to create a path, you have to use the paths tool. So I'll click here on the paths tool. So this allows you to set points that will create a path. So I'll left click, and that creates our first point, and then you left click again, and that sets another point. If you left click and hold and you drag, then you'll get these Bezier curve handles, which allows you to kind of change the root of your path as you go between the two points. So paths can be curved, and then if I left click after setting a Bezier curve handle, the uh, third point is still gonna be using the curves from this middle point. If I left click again after that, well, this one doesn't have any curves, so it's just gonna be a straight line. So when you left click and hold and you create the curves, you can create some interesting path shapes. So with paths, you can do something like create a stroke line of the path, or as you saw, you can snap to the path. So let's go ahead and click paths next to the layer window. Uh, you can see any of the paths that we worked on are selectable here, right? So they're actually not drawn onto the document, but it exists within your document as something you can use as a guide. Okay, so if you click around and you accidentally hide your paths, don't worry, because they're actually in the paths window over here on the right next to layers. So you can see the paths you have created actually still exist here inside of the document, but not as visual information. So you can click on the left side of them to have the eyeball icon to show them pop up. So here's the first path I created. I'll hide that for now. And if I want to take this path and I want to use it to stroke a line on the document, Let's go to layers and create a new layer. And I'll just call this path stroke. Hit enter to create it. Go back to paths, right click on the path and then do stroke path. So we'll need to give it a pixels line amount. By default, it's gonna use the solid color of your foreground color. So in this case, that's red. I'll hit stroke. So now you can see the path I created before can be followed by that stroke path tool. So that allows you to create more precise shapes rather than trying to freehand things with the paintbrush tool. Let's also use the move tool uh, in the view menu. Note that snap to active path is selected and let's left click on our text and move it to the path. So we can now have it snap along this path. So the path itself is just information that exists inside of your GIMP document, but itself is not visible but you can use it for other things like snapping or filling in an actual solid color line that does follow that path. But you can hide the path and it's not gonna change anything. But when you export your image, the path is not gonna show up itself in any way. So before your path can actually be visually seen, you do need to use it with other tools like stroke path on a layer that has actual visual information for it to show up on the document. Okay, so for right now, I'm going to hide all the layers except for the background layer. And for the paths, I'm going to hide the unnamed path one. So none of the paths are showing. Let's also remove these guides and just kind of clear up the screen. So I'm going to use the move tool and move them off of the canvas. So that gets rid of your guide immediately. And the next thing I will show is layer masks inside of GIMP. So if I was to select the background layer, right click on it and do add a layer mask. Uh, by default, we can initialize it with full opacity, which means that everywhere inside of our drawn color information part of that layer will be visible. We can use black, which is going to make it entirely invisible. And when you use the layer mask, you just make the parts that you want to be visible white on the layer mask part of the layer. 
and then the areas where you want to hide, you do black. And if you want it to be partially visible, then you go some kind of gray in between full white or full black. So let's use white as the default layer mask. I'll add it. And you'll see that a new image pops up right next to the color information part of this background layer. So if I select that with left click, and you can see that you can select the color information part or the background part. Let's hit P to go to paintbrush tool. I'm going to switch the color to black so that I'm actually painting full transparency onto the layer mask layer. Let's increase the size a bit on the paintbrush tool, and I'm going to left click and drag on our document. So you'll see that the areas where I draw become completely transparent, but I'm actually not deleting anything from the color information part. I'm masking it out. So I'm hiding it or making it visible again, depending on if the layer mask is white or black. So if I right click on this layer mask and I do delete layer mask, you can see the color information is all there. I didn't undo. I just got rid of the layer mask. So another way that you can add in a layer mask would be to bring in a shape into GIMP. So I'm going to open up Finder on my Mac and I have this image from a previous tutorial. I'm just going to drag this into GIMP and it's going to be added as a new layer for us to use. So by default, this is just a black colored image and I'll hide the background layer so you can see that. But we can take this shape and use it as a layer mask instead. So to do that, I'm going to right click on the image layer we just brought into the document, do alpha to selection. So you see that this matches the size and shape and position of that image I just brought in. Now I'm going to right click on the background layer, add layer mask and do selection. So when I hit add, the area inside of this shape is going to be white and everything outside of it is going to be black, which means this part's going to be visible and everything else is going to be invisible as soon as I enable that background layer. Now I also need to disable the square image because that is a higher layer. So it is hiding anything in the background. So you can see with that, that we take a shape and now only the areas inside of that shape are going to show on this background image. If I switch to M for move tool and I have the layer mask selected, let's left click and let's move around that shape on the screen. So I'm not moving the color information. I'm moving the layer mask. So by doing that, you can move your shape and show or hide parts of your image that you want to show. If you want, you can left click on the color information part of the layer and let's hold shift down to move the active layer. So layer masks are really powerful because you can keep the background color information intact while changing what you want to show or what you want to hide with the layer masks. And there are other ways you can do it than just using the layer mask, but the layer mask is the most straightforward way of achieving this kind of effect where you show or hide part of a background area without actually destroying the background and physically erasing the shape with something like the eraser tool, which would be quite different. So you can see if I do that and I switch back to the layer mask and let's move this around that no matter where I position it, because I erased the color information, it's still going to be invisible because there's nothing there for the layer mask to allow to show through. So that's the difference there between using the eraser or the layer masks. Let's use the uh, undo history and go back a little bit more. Okay, right there before the eraser. Sure. Okay, last up to wrap up this tutorial video, let's talk about the colors menu and the filters menu. So these are going to be most of your effects inside of GIMP. So if there is a change you want to make to the color specifically of the area you have selected or the layer you have selected, then you can come into this color menu and change it around. So whenever you're talking about saturation, you're talking about the amount of color. So if you desaturate, you're moving it towards black and white. And if you super saturate it, you're moving it towards a very vivid color brightness contrast if you're talking about brightness it's upping the light amount of everything in that area and uh, let me actually just select some of these tools while i talk about them so it'll make more sense so hue saturation leaving it as master color will affect everything or you can select specific colors on your screen if you want to only affect the reds or the blues so if we change the hue you change the color without changing the vividness of the color. Decrease the saturation. You make everything black and white. If you super saturate it, now it's very vivid. And then lightness makes everything bright or everything very dark. So let's hit cancel there. Similarly, if we go to brightness contrast, brightness basically the same as the lightness from the other option. And contrast is going to make the difference between the colors in your area 
more dramatic. So high contrast is going to make it very obvious, the difference between the colors on your screen. And then if you decrease all the contrast, it's going to go uh, harder and harder to see the difference between your colors until at max negative contrast, they're the same color actually. So other tools like threshold, if you want to take everything in your image and make it hard white or hard black uh, based on a threshold or a certain value. So everything above a threshold is going to be one color and then everything below it is going to be the other color. So once you do that, you could hit OK. And then if you didn't want it to keep being black or white, but you wanted to add the color back in, we could go up to the color menu and then let's use the color curves. So with that, let's take some of these channels. If you don't already know, white is going to have max value for red, white and blue. So if we decrease one of those channels, it's going to shift the color towards something else. So if I decrease the blue to now, it's going to make it more red uh, since the red is dominating the blue and the green right now. And I can change the red. Let's shift that down. If you move everything towards the bottom, you're going to get a very dark color. So that's one tool you can play around with if you want to shift your colors towards something else. And there's a bunch of other tools here, but basically the color menu obviously is going to deal with colors. So for everything else, you have the filters menu. So if you want to blur your layers, then you have all of the options in here. So a simple Gaussian blur. If we go into this menu, you can see the preview right here. You can see the preview already inside of the layer. You can toggle that on and off if you want to see the difference. If you increase the size of your Gaussian blur, that's going to be taking your pixels and making the color information spread further out, making the screen look blurry. So we can hit cancel for that. Uh, for now, I will re-enable the text layer. So another menu that I often use is light and shadow. So if you want to drop shadow effect on your text, making them a little bit more 3D, then you can do that. You can see the default drop shadow there. It's a little bit blurry. It goes down into the right. But here I can show my presets. Um, so if you have no blur radius and a 2.0 opacity, you can see it's very clear. This is actually almost like a long shadow. And if you play around with your settings and you have a, a settings that you want to use as a preset, just click this add button and it will show up there as a new preset that you can use in any of your future documents. Let's hit cancel for that right now. And then I'll go up to filters and then we have long shadow. So one of the main differences between long shadow and drop shadow is that drop shadow by default is blurry, but the long shadows are a solid color. Here we can see some of the other settings I've played around with. You can see that you can change the color, the angle at which the shadow occurs, the, the angle and the length of the shadow. Uh, when you want it to go a certain direction and how long you want it to be. It's pretty self-explanatory as long as you keep the preview checked so you can hit OK when you want to apply it. Uh, note that all of these effects will make your text layers no longer a text layer. So if you use T to go to your text tool and then you click on your text layer, then you can see that you can edit the text layer. You can actually return it to a text layer. But if you do that, it will undo all of the changes that you've made to the text layer since it stopped being a text layer. So that's why I'll usually just leave it as a text layer. And if I need to make changes, uh, like filling it in with a gradient, I would put it as a new background layer that just fits the selection of the text layer, but without destroying the text layer, as I showed earlier in the video. So let's see other filters you might want. Uh, adding a vignette effect. If we add a new layer and hit OK, um, and I'm going to put this basically more towards the background side of things so that it hides behind text. We can go up to filters, light and shadow, vignette. And this will make the edges of your screen uh, darker with that vignette effect. You can adjust the handles here to uh, adjust where it's going to show up or where it's not. Now, note these also change the values over here. So you can change it in the pop-up window as well if you want. Usually the visual indicators are just easier to understand because you can see everything as you're making the changes and not worrying so much about the exact numbers over here. So if we pull in on these areas, then you're controlling where it starts and where it ends. The outer ring, of course, is the end of your effect. And then you can go ahead and hit OK. And then you can see kind of your vignette showing up there. You can hide or disable it as long as you made it a, a separate layer. So once again, keeping as many of your changes separate from each other is really helpful inside of GIMP. So I can hide that if I don't want to see it. Let's go down to filters, artistic, and try something like glass tile. So most of these artistic effects are actually going to drastically change how everything you've got going on there looks. So let's adjust that and hit OK. And 
if we adjust the position of the layer mask by selecting it in the layers panel and moving it around, we can kind of see how that's going to affect everything in the background there. So that's kind of an interesting effect I haven't tried. So you can find all kinds of stuff over here. And if you want even more effects, then one library you can download is called Gimmick. That is G-M-I-C. If you go ahead and Google that, you should be able to find it. And that's a package with a whole bunch of extra filter effects you can download for GIMP. As far as I'm aware, all of those effects are also compatible with Mac as well. So that in a nutshell is pretty much going to be it for my GIMP for Mac video. This is a pretty broad overview of the features inside of GIMP. Obviously, there is a lot more to the program uh, that you can learn and pick up as you go along. If you want more specific tutorials, feel free to check out my channel. I have plenty of tutorials going back years on how to use GIMP in general. If you got to this point, thanks for watching to the end. Feel free to leave a comment down below and let me know what you thought of the video. I've been Chris, and I will see all of you in my future video content.